everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, Eat up and enjoy. Uh, one could certainly do a very long uh, preamble to our speaker because he's been distinguished for decades in multiple areas of endocrinology nationally. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you that very early on, when I was a medical student and I heard him lecture and later through other contacts, I was astounded that he was of national stature in both diabetes and also neuroendocrinology and pituitary. I don't know how you do that, but he's done that. Uh, and now he's going to uh, let us have some of his expertise on the diabetes side. Uh, so Dr. Mark Mowich from Northwestern uh, in Chicago, and once upon a time, I'm in Boston. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And if we can, oh, magic. All right. So we're going to talk about type 1 diabetes. And anybody who talks about type 1 diabetes is really going to be talking about insulin. I'm not going to be talking about insulin. So this is going to be somewhat of an unusual uh, discussion. So uh, again, you're supposed to sign in if you want to get some kind of credits uh, for this. Uh, this is the talk in, in general is sponsored by an unrestricted educational grant from uh, Santa Fe and from Lexicon. Um, and uh, there are all kinds of disclosures that you have in those pamphlets uh, out there. And so please do the pre-activity survey. Um, and hand those in, I guess, especially if you want to get uh, CME credit for those for those of you who wish to get CME credit. So this is what we're going to be talking about over the course of the next uh, few minutes. Uh, talk about people who have type 1 diabetes that really is not optimal control. Uh, whether we can have additional modalities of treatment to help patients get under better diabetes control. Talk about some of the newer medications that can be used in people with type 1 as well as type 2 diabetes. Um, and really to think about how you might then use information in sort of planning a, a practice strategy for your patients with type 1 diabetes. So what this slide shows is people who have type 1 diabetes, whose data is incorporated in a large uh, type 1 diabetes database called the, the T1D exchange looking at hemoglobin A1C levels according to age. And you see that the mean A1C levels are actually pretty high, especially in the younger individuals, and certainly well above what we would consider to be good diabetes control, that is an A1C of 7% or less. So if you look at the percentage of individuals uh, who are actually able to get to this target level of less than 7%, it's only about a quarter of people who have type 1 diabetes. Uh, especially in the uh, adult population, much less than that uh, in the children. Now, one of the concerns that we also have is that people are starting to sort of become, develop type 2 diabetes along with type 1 diabetes as they get overweight. Uh, and we're all familiar with the obesity epidemic in this country. Well, it's not limited to people without type 1 diabetes. Those people also gain weight. And as you see here, again, we're having people who are overweight similar to what we see in the normal population. About two-thirds of the normal population uh, is either overweight or obese. So one of the concerns that we've all had in taking care of people with type 1 diabetes who are all taking insulin, the major limiting factor is the development of hypoglycemia. And so that if you overtreat people, if you don't have a good matching of insulin along with meals, you get a hypoglycemia. And this looks at severe hypoglycemia which means seizure or loss of consciousness uh, for one or, event or more per year. And you can see here that's 1 to 2% of people with severe hypoglycemia. We're not talking about the mild hypoglycemia that's going to be occurring probably several times a week in people with type 1 diabetes. We're talking about these severe episodes. And these are clearly the ones that are very devastating to patients. On the opposite side, we have a diabetic ketoacidosis. It's also pretty rare, uh, but not, uh, not unheard of. More common in the younger population, as you see here, but even adults uh, who've got type 1 diabetes as they either develop their diabetes as an adult or have for, you know, just had their diabetes for a number of years, still are at risk for diabetic ketoacidosis. So that's on the flip side from the hypoglycemia. 
So we have some numbers. We have limitations then for the standard insulin therapy uh, that we use for type 1 diabetes. Um, we can get to close to normal glu glucose levels, but it takes a lot of effort to get there, as those of you who take care of some patients with type 1 diabetes know how much effort it does to get somebody down to an A1C of less than 7%. Uh, they tend to not be well controlled. There can be a lot of glucose variation depending upon day-to-day -day activity, how much food people are eating, whether they're taking their insulin appropriately with that, how much exercise and stress that they have. Uh, again, hypoglycemia is a limiting factor here, especially that severe hypoglycemia. Because of the sort of mismatch of things, people tend to overeat, uh, just like we all do, uh, but they also may overeat to prevent it getting hypoglycemic. Uh, we still have the effects of coronary artery disease. That's still the major cause of death for people with diabetes, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Diabetic ketoacidosis does remain a problem, although relatively modest, but we, in fact, you all do see it uh, periodically on the inpatient side. And so that we have a lot of therapies that we can use from an insulin point of view. We can give insulin multiple times a day. We can use insulin pumps. But in fact, there may still be other things that could be done to help to improve diabetes care. So what we're going to do is to talk about some adjunctive therapies that can be used in type 1 diabetes and look at some of the efficacy of some of these approaches. So would you uh, get a, a more stable glucose profile, so less hypoglycemia, less weight gain, less excursion of the glucose up and down? Um, it's certainly not going to replace insulin. Um, maybe the insulin doses can be decreased, but uh, in fact, that's not sort of a major thrust uh, of this approach. <clears throat> so uh, as, as far as the non-insulin uh, treatment options, they're sort of listed here, and we're going to be going through these because all of these have been tested uh, at one point or another. Well, the overall thing here is trying to reduce the weight gain, trying to reduce the hypoglycemia, and at the same time get better glycemic control. So there's only one drug that has been approved by the FDA for adjunctive therapy for patients with type 1 diabetes besides insulin, and that's pramlantide, uh, and that is shown here. So the only FDA-approved drug. And the problem here is that you have to give it by injection. It has to be given with each meal at the same time that you're giving insulin with each meal. Uh, but it's sort of indicated in patients who don't have good control despite sort of optimal insulin therapy. Um, and it, it can, uh, there's a warning about severe hypoglycemia. Really, any of these adjunctive agents are added to insulin, so it can increase the potential risk, at least, of severe hypoglycemia. So what is this? What's pramlantide? So it turns out that this, is, this has been developed uh, biochemically and by the pharmacology people. Uh, it's an analog of amylin, and amylin is a, a protein that's present in the pancreas. It actually does have some actions at the brain to improve satiety, so to prevent uh, excessive uh, food intake. It delays gastric emptying so that you have a slow release of food from the stomach uh, and cause an increase in satiety that way as well. Uh, it works on the liver to reduce the rise in glucagon that occurs after a meal. And so, in fact, when you use pramlantide along with insulin, it does actually have some benefits. And so these are data at three, zero to three months and three to six months. And looking at placebo versus pramlantide, and you're looking at the long-term trials uh, of individuals and look at the uh, incidence of severe hypoglycemia, and it is increased uh, with pramlantide compared to placebo for both uh, uh, three and, and uh, six months as well as uh, the earlier period of time. Now, what it will do is that it will decrease the rise in glucose that's occurring after a meal. And so this is a, looking at individuals who have a regular meal, a mixed meal here, and you see the uh, rise in insulin that's, a uh, rise in glucose that's occurring here. And then with pramlantide, you sort of prevent that rise in glucose. And so it's having uh, an effect here in trying to limit the excursion of glucose that's occurring after the meal, along with giving insulin. So this is with regular insulin, this is with Lyspro insulin, and you can see with both of these effects, you're modifying that rise in glucose that occurs after the meal. And so that when you look at some of the longer-term studies, looking at the effects on hemoglobin A1C level, you see a greater reduction in A1C between pramlantide compared to placebo. Looking at the amount of insulin use, uh, there's a sort of a general increasing amount of insulin that's occurring here, 
We're talking about just a couple of units here. Uh, really, really no change with pramlantide. And in fact, people do tend to lose a little bit of weight uh, with pramlantide. And so it really does have efficacy, improving glucose levels, improving long-term hemoglobin A1C, reducing body weight. So this is really a worthwhile drug that can be done uh, to be added uh, to individuals. And so looking at the change in hemoglobin A1C, though, when you look at the actual magnitude, however, of the change, we're talking about a relatively modest difference here, about 0.3 to 0.4 percent. Uh, in all subjects, in those people who didn't have any reduction in insulin doses, it was a little bit uh, greater than that. But there are lots of adverse effects that can occur with pramlantide. We see here the nausea, the anorexia uh, that can occur, uh, vomiting, so that it's not all that benign a therapy. And really the major thing that I think that has prevented this from uh, really coming to the fore and being used very frequently is it has to be given by an injection with each meal. So that when we're taking care of our patients with type 1 diabetes, we have them taking a long-acting insulin. We have them take as a basal insulin. We have a short-acting insulin with each meal. So that's four injections per day. If you're then going to add pramlantide to that, you're going to have seven injections per day. You know, most people don't like to do that. And so that it has never really caught on uh, as, as a, a good uh, treatment modality. So this is a meta-analysis of a number of studies that have been done looking at the uh, uh, reduction in A1C. And in fact, the A1C does reduce with the medication. But in fact, it takes a lot of effort on the patient. They don't like to give the injections. So it's really never caught on. But it is still available, still in the market. It can be used in some patients. So let's move on to look at some more traditional types of therapies that I think you're familiar with for taking care of people with type 2 diabetes. We can start with metformin. You're all familiar with metformin. It's been around for a long period of time. And in fact, if you look at studies where it has been given to individuals with type, with type 1 diabetes rather than type 2 diabetes, and looking at the change in hemoglobin A1C, there's a minus 0.2% uh, difference in hemoglobin A1C in this study <coughs> without any real change in insulin doses. So again, there's a little bit of benefit, but not a lot of benefit uh, from a biochemical point of view. There were more adverse effects that were occurring with metformin as well, and mainly GI side effects. Again, for all of you who take care of patients with type 2 diabetes and using metformin, you're familiar with the GI side effects that can occur in 15 uh, to 20 percent or more patients. Many of them will just tolerate the, the side effects if they're not severe, but they will often continue with that. This is another study called the removal study where metformin was added to insulin in patients with type 1 diabetes. And looking here at the change in hemoglobin A1C level over time, you can see here that with metformin, it was a little bit lower here, but the difference at the end of the study in hemoglobin and A1C was only 0.1%. There's a reduction in insulin dose, but a very minimal change. There was some improvement in body weight and at the end of the study, which was a 36-month study, a three-year study. Again, the difference in here is a little bit over one kilogram over this point in time, over a three-year period of time. So again, very minimal effect on glucose levels, some, but really pretty minimal. Um, the other benefit really is a decrease in body weight, but again, a relatively modest decrease in body weight. There was a decrease in insulin doses, but the amount of decrease in insulin doses was really pretty small, it's just 1 or 2 percent uh, in total insulin dose, really not a clinically significant amount. So it's been tried, has a little bit of benefit but really not very much. Now, there's colocevalam, which can be used to treat diabetes. Does anybody here even know what colocevalam is? OK, it's used to treat hyperlipidemia, elevated LDL levels as sort of a third-line agent. And it turns out in doing the studies and looking at it as a hyperlipidemia agent, it also improves glucose levels. So it has a, an actual indication for treatment of diabetes. I don't know how many people in this country are taking colocevalam to treat diabetes, but it's probably pretty small. Anyway, so it's been used for treatment of type 2 diabetes. It has also been used to look at patients with type 1 diabetes, looking at the benefits of colocevalam compared to placebo. And you can see here that there was no real benefit from colocevalam. So it's another one that we kind of scratch off the list. Well, DPP-4 inhibitors we do use. They're commonly used drugs for type 2 diabetes, uh, and they work, you know, reasonably well. 
in people with type 2 diabetes, a reduction of hemoglobin A1C in the order of about maybe 0.6, 0.8% in that sort of a range. So they're effective. They're also very well tolerated with very little in the way of side effects. So what about using them in type 1 diabetes? And we have to remember what DPP-4 inhibitors do, that they're really sort of allowing endogenous glucagon-like peptide 1 rise in the blood and the beneficial effects that that might have in somebody with type 1 diabetes. And in fact, when you look at the hemoglobin A1C levels in the study uh, uh, over the course of time, the difference in A1C was relatively modest, uh, really not a major clinically significant change. Uh, <clears throat> this is looking at the, uh, again, at the A1C levels with cetagliptin over a longer period of time, 16-week study. Again, the difference here, when you look at the ordinate here and look at the actual numbers here, the difference is about 0.2 to 0.3%. Uh, reduction in hemoglobin A1C level. So there is some benefit, but again, a pretty modest type of a benefit. So let's move on to other classes. We'll look at GLP-1 receptor agonists. Uh, and again, these are drugs that we use commonly in people uh, who have type 2 diabetes. Uh, liraglutide is one of the more common ones that we use, given injection on a once-a-day basis. Um, and uh, there are several other GLP-1 receptor agonists. Now, before I get into the data on looking at GLP-1 receptor agonists in type 1 diabetes, you should understand that there are now data that are coming out for type 2 diabetes that are very clear data showing cardiovascular benefit and benefit for liraglutide for, uh, <clears throat> and semaglutide uh, uh, for these drugs that are clearly showing benefit of cardiovascular benefit. So if they show that in type 2 diabetes, they probably would have that benefit in type 1 diabetes, although whether you can truly extrapolate that from type 2 to type 1 diabetes, I think, is, is kind of an open question, but I think most of us would suggest that it, or, or think that it probably is true. But what about the benefit from a diabetes perspective in lowering glucose levels? So for liraglutide, there have been several studies that have been done, adjunct 1, adjunct 2, there, there's always names for all these studies where they gave liraglutide in increasing doses compared to placebo. Uh, and so then looking at the effects of this, and again, it's hard to see all of this from the back of the room, but looking at hemoglobin A1Cs with different doses of medication, which is sort of the major endpoint that you would have in a study like this, is that the reduction in hemoglobin A1C here, what you have to see here is that it's hard for even me to see here. This is 7.4, this is 7.8. And so that we're talking about a difference here of about 0.2% uh, percent in hemoglobin A1C. <coughs> uh, again, looking at this over the course of time, uh, these are the two different studies. Uh, there is also a reduction in body weight that, that occurs, and that you can see here, is that with all GLP-1 receptor agonists, all of them have a substantial effect in causing people to lose weight. And this occurs also in the patients with type, two di type 1 diabetes as well as those with type 2 diabetes. However, there was also an increase in hypoglycemia that occurred in these studies. Again, the two different studies. And these are the three different doses of liraglutide compared to placebo. And looking at the events per subject, so that there was an increase in the frequency of hypoglycemia when these drugs were added to standard insulin therapy compared to placebo. And this looks at the severe hypoglycemic events in the rate uh, per one patient year. And again, with placebo, 0.19, not terribly increased. But in fact, when we saw that with adjunct 2, it was an uh, increase in that particular study. And so that when you looked at those individuals who were able to achieve an A1C of less than 7% without any severe hypoglycemia, then in fact, there was a slightly increased amount here uh, compared to those individuals who were receiving only placebo. And these were statistically significant for at least the, the higher dose of the medication but not the lower doses for this uh, adjunct 2 study. Now, there's also an increase in hyperglycemia with, with ketoacidosis, that is, uh, uh, in this study, and showing that, again, with liraglutide at the three different doses, there was an increase in ketoacidosis compared to the placebo for both of these studies. Let's skip that one. So the, the endpoint was reached uh, that there was a significant drop in A1C, but again, it was a drop of about 0.2, 0.3% uh, at best. Uh, there was a drop in, in weight, no question. It could be a drop in weight, not weight loss. The amount of insulin that they were taking reduced slightly. But because of the increase in hypoglycemia, because of the increase in ketoacidosis, uh, 
the manufacturers of this uh, drug decided not to pursue this as an indication that it's for treatment of type 1 diabetes. They thought that the benefit-risk ratio uh, was just not there uh, for treatment of type 1 diabetes. This is a, another study, which was a 52-week study uh, that looked at all of this. Uh, and so they had 26 patients receive the, the higher dose versus 20 patients who received only placebo. They looked at continuous glucose monitoring uh, of the study before and at the end of treatment. And again, there was some improvement in blood glucose levels, weight, and blood pressure. Uh, and what we see here is that the A1C dropped from 7.45% um, and uh, a drop in glucose level 174 to 156. There were no changes with hypoglycemia or the percent of time that was spent in the hypoglycemic range of less than 70. There was a significant weight loss of about 3 kilograms over the study. Blood pressure changed very slightly and diastolic also decreased slightly as well. Uh, so that uh, there are other studies that using other of these GLP-1 receptor agonists in type 1 diabetes that are ongoing. So this possible that it could be this class could come to the fore over time uh, for treatment of type 1 diabetes. But I think at this point in time, things are kind of on hold as far as us using these clinically to add uh, for type 1 diabetes. So let's turn now <coughs> to SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, this slide is a little bit old. It's got dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, and, and canagliflozin. There's now a fourth uh, SGLT2 inhibitor that's on the market called ertugliflozin. Um, one always wonders, you know, when you have so many drugs in a class, do you really need the sixth, eighth inhibitor or the tenth ARB? Do you really need the fourth SGLT2 inhibitor? But anyway, there are now four of these currently available on the market. So let's start with dapagliflozin. Uh, and this was really one of the largest studies that were done in patients with type 1 diabetes. I think you're all familiar with how these drugs work. We use them all the time in type 2 diabetes. And remember what they do is they block glucose reabsorption uh, in the proximal, tubule, uh, proximal part of the uh, uh, tubule in patients with diabetes, or well, people without diabetes as well. And so that you're causing an increase in glucose excretion that carries calories with it. It also drops the blood glucose level, so it has benefits in cause improving glucose levels, causing some weight loss uh, as well. There are also now three cardiovascular studies, as I mentioned before, with GLP-1 receptor agonists. We now have three cardiovascular studies with SGLT2 inhibitors, with dapagliflozin, canagliflozin, and epagliflozin, all showing cardiovascular benefit. And so you remember, I don't know if you know that about 10 years ago, when any new drug that came to the market for diabetes uh, the FDA mandated that there had to be a cardiovascular outcome study that was done. And so that all drugs that have come to the market over the last 10 years or so have to have these large-scale studies. And what most of these studies have shown over the years is that they don't show any harm, which was the design of these studies that not show any harm. But the surprise over the last few years is that those GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, did in fact show cardiovascular benefit and in particular, for the SGLT2 inhibitors, all three of these drugs have now shown cardiovascular benefit. And uh, one of the main things that they show is that benefit in heart failure. So there's good reason to think that it'd be nice to be able to use these drugs in type 1 diabetes as well, because perhaps not only lowering glucose levels, but also for the cardiovascular benefit. So again, dapagliflozin was really the first one uh, that, that sort of came around. Uh, the DEPICT-1 trial was done in type 1 diabetes as well, uh, and so that two different doses were done and significantly reduced hemoglobin A1C levels compared to uh, a controlled. There were very minimal side effects. Um, and so the 24-week studies for this showed as an oral agent that, uh, in fact, there were clinically relevant benefits as far as hemoglobin A1C benefits. So, in fact, this may be something that could be used. And in fact, here we look at the hemoglobin A1C difference compared to placebo. Uh, what you see here is the difference here is now starting to be a little bit more clinically meaningful, about a 0.5% uh, difference uh, compared to placebo. And so that, you know, this really now starts to say, well, maybe this may be clinically important. There was a reduction in the amount of insulin that was these for patients, and it's on the order of about uh, 5 to 10 or, or more units of insulin per day. Also, so patients needed less insulin to achieve the same degree of glycemic control. These are studies done with empagliflozin, 
uh, called the EASE trials. Uh, and so again, uh, the different doses were used. There's a 0.6%, 7% lowering hemoglobin A1C level at week four, 0.49% uh, with the 10 milligram dose and 0.48% uh, with the 25 milligram dose. So again, we're talking about now clinically meaningful differences uh, in hemoglobin A1C. Subsequent trials were a little bit longer studies, 52 weeks and 26 studies. Again, these are our prospective randomized studies against placebo, looking at the particular benefit. Uh, and so that there were significant A1C reductions, significant reduction in body weight. Uh, there was no significant increase in hypoglycemia, either mild or severe. Uh, and there was, however, an increase in diabetic ketoacidosis. So we're going to come back to that uh, in just a moment. So now we have canagliflozin, the third of these drugs. Uh, again, again, a type 1 study, fairly large study, 351 individuals. Looking at the change in hemoglobin A1C compared to placebo, again, a 0.3, 0 0.2 to 3% uh, difference here, a reduction in body weight uh, that I see here as well. However, there were an increase in ketoacidosis, 5.1% to 9.4% was increased versus 0% with placebo. So this has been shown now for type 1 diabetes. There's also an increased risk of ketoacidosis when this class of drugs is used in type 2 diabetes. Uh, and exactly why this is occurring is not entirely clear. There's probably multiple different reasons why it occurs. In general, people reduce their dose of insulin a little bit to, to avoid hypoglycemia. And so that you may reduce it a little bit too much to allow somebody to become not 100% insulinized. There may be some increase in glucagon levels or changes in excretion of ketones as well. So there's probably a number of reasons why this occurs. And so this is clearly an increase in risk uh, with patients. Um, let me just come back to this for just a moment. So um, right now, using any of these three uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in type 1, with type 1 diabetes is clearly off-label use. So these are experimental studies. They show that there is some benefit. There clearly is off-label use if we decided we wanted to use these drugs clinically in our patients. And I do do, I do, do this. So I treat my patients off-label with some of these SGLT2 inhibitors, and they actually do work. And they do show some benefit in glucose levels, but in fact, there is a risk of ketoacidosis, which has to be carefully explained to patients that this can occur. I have actually have patients uh, measuring the urine ketones uh, when they're using these medications. And then you stop the drug if there's any patients not feeling very well, you ask them to check their ketones. And obviously, the patients are at risk for ketoacidosis, but in fact, they do like using these drugs because it seems to even out their glucose levels. They have less excursions of the high glucose level. So let's turn now to a, a last drug, uh, which is also in this class of SGLT2 inhibitors called sodagliflozin. So this is a, a, a now a fifth SGLT2 inhibitor. It is not yet on the market, but in fact it is at the FDA at the present time with the indication for treatment of type 1 diabetes, which is what we're talking about today. So it has a specific indication that they're going for to treat type 1 diabetes. So again, remember how what SGLT2 does, it's really working at the kidney level to block the absorption of glucose in the proximal uh, part of the tubule, and so that you have an increase in glucose excretion. So SGLT1 uh, is, a, is a, another sodium glucose transporter compared to SGLT2, where it works in the kidney. It also has some effect in the, in the kidney, but also has effect in the gut. And by effects in the gut, it decreases the rise in glucose that occurs after uh, a meal. It also causes an increase in GLP-1 as well. How much of the drug, this, this new drug, estosodiglifosin, which has actions at both SOT1 and SOT2, how much of its biochemical effects are due to this intestinal effect is really not entirely clear. So again, there's a, a, what's called a tandem study where they have different studies in phase two and phase three that are, again, varying degrees of, of uh, duration of these studies as well, looking primarily at the efficacy of this medication in reducing hemoglobin A1C levels as well as the uh, uh, adverse effects. So looking at the pooled data for these studies, looking at the changes in the hemoglobin A1C level, you can see that here that with uh, 
Uh, placebo went from 8.31 to 7.66. So this is at the prior uh, to entry into the study where there was an optimization of all the insulin therapy. And then you can then, at this point, then compare the effect of the medication uh, of this new drug, sotagliflozin, compared to placebo. And you can see here that the reduction compared to placebo is only about 0.4% for this study at 24 weeks, and then 0.2 to 0.3% uh, at 52 weeks. And so, again, it does have some modest effects uh, in reducing glucose levels and improving glycemic control. There's also an improvement in body weight. Uh, looking at the treatment uh, compared to placebo here, uh, two to three kilogram uh, reduction in body weight as well. And so that we're having an improvement in glucose levels as well as an improvement in body weight for our patients that are gaining weight. <clears throat> and then this looks at the sort of a composite endpoint uh, of looking at the uh, hemoglobin A1C level less than 7% with no weight gain, with no severe hypoglycemia, the combination uh, of these, and also then finally without any diabetic ketoacidosis. And in fact, with sotagliflozin, there was an increase in the percentage of patients who met all of these endpoints uh, compared to placebo. So uh, this has some promise, at least, uh, for patients with type 1 diabetes. So again, this is the last portion of that slide. So the net clinical benefit, then, of an A1C less than 7% without severe hypoglycemia, without diabetic ketoacidosis at 52 weeks, again, it's about double here with uh, the medication compared to placebo. Uh, I think that's just the other study. One of the other things that you can look at from these studies is that, as I mentioned with uh, this, the drugs that are currently on the market that I've used, is that it seems to improve the overall uh, glucose excursion so that there's a narrowing of the band of glucose throughout the course of the day without the lows and the highs that are occurring throughout the day. And so this is a study that looks at time in range, okay? This is a part of these tandem studies. Uh, and so this is using a continuous glucose monitoring uh, before starting and then after starting medication. Uh, and this is with placebo versus sotagliflozin. And so that looking at the glucose in range 70 to 180, that's sort of in the dark red here, and so that you can see here with uh, placebo going from 56% to 54%, but here going from 56% to 68%. So that, again, you're, you're, you're having more people within the range that you would like them to be in uh, over the course of time. And, and patients notice this. This is something that they feel that, you know, things are just better, uh, that I'm not seeing so much hyperglycemia. Um, let's get back. So let's come back to diabetic ketoacidosis. Again, this is a well-recognized phenomenon in type 2 diabetes. It's now well recognized in these studies with type 1 diabetes for all of these agents, so that it's something that we have to be aware of. You all have to be aware of this also for those of you who work in the emergency room uh, for a patient that comes in who may be in, in acidosis, and you say, well, they can't be in diabetic ketoacidosis because the blood sugar level is only 220. Well, in fact, this is something called euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. And because of the way that these drugs work to lower glucose levels, the patients may present in ketoacidosis with relatively modest elevations in blood sugar. It's not truly euglycemic. I mean, they don't have blood sugar levels of 90, okay? But they'll have blood sugar levels of 180, 200, 220, 240. Not the usual patient that you see with a blood sugar level of 6 or 700. So it's a modest glucose elevation. You do need to be aware of this situation for type, with type 1, type 2 diabetes. And if, in fact, you are now treating patients with type 1 diabetes, you have to be particularly aware of it. Uh, in those patients. So this looks at, again, in the sotagliflozin studies, looking at the frequency of diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, and in fact, uh, the rates of ketoacidosis are clearly increased with sotagliflozin, 3% compared to 0.6% for this study, and 4.1% compared to 1.5% for depict with dapagliflozin. So there's no question that there's an increased risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. So, when we're treating patients, whether with this new drug or with any of the other SGLT2 inhibitors, and again, many of the endocrinologists here are using these drugs uh, in, in type 1 uh, and certainly in type 2 diabetes, is that if you have a patient who's not going to be eating, then we hold the medication to avoid this risk for diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, if they're on a very, we try to avoid high keto, ketogenic diets, they're very low carbohydrate diets. 
uh, and then make sure that the patient continues to take their insulin. Of course, many patients, when they go into ketoacidosis, say, well, you know, I'm not feeling well, I'm not eating, so therefore I shouldn't take my insulin, which is always the wrong answer. Patients always have to take their insulin. They just have to check their blood sugar level more frequently. They may need to adapt their dose, but in fact, they do have to take their insulin. So if they're nausea or sick in any way, again, hold the drug, check the urine for ketones, and obviously give a call if there's any question at all. If ketones are positive, again, they ha obviously have to take their insulin. And again, many of my patients, you know, if they call me talking about this, I treat them at home. Uh, I can treat most ketoacidosis at home before it ever gets to the point of getting to the uh, emergency room with trying to give them some rectal composine, making sure they can get fluids, taking their insulin, taking their blood sugar levels, uh, very frequently, so that usually can do. Uh, but uh, again, this particular class of drugs will increase that risk for ketoacidosis. And so again, my patients who I treat off-label with the three drugs that are, or the, actually now four drugs that are currently available, is that I have people checking the urine ketones on a daily basis for the first couple of weeks. After that, I have them do it once a week uh, and just maintain that if they start going negative to trace, that's sort of an allowable amount of ketones, but it starts to getting one plus or two plus for urine ketones, then they need to stop the medication and, and give me a call. Patients who are poorly compliant with insulin will be poorly compliant with this regimen as well, and so you probably just shouldn't uh, treat uh, patients like that with these medications. So let's just finish up then. We've talked about patients with type 1 diabetes. So they are becoming overweight. Our treatments are not uh, perfect. Insulin is not a perfect drug. Can we use some of these or other agents to help treat these patients with type 1 diabetes? Most of the oral agents and the injectables that I talked about, I think, are not suitable for most patients with type 1 diabetes. I think the data on GLP-1 receptor agonists is still out there. I think that it's not ready for prime time, but uh, I would still keep an open mind about that because there may be some other studies uh, ongoing. Uh, and, but the SLT2 inhibitors, I think, are probably ready for people who have a lot of experience in treating diabetes, who are willing to use these off-label with appropriate instruction of patients that, in fact, it is an off-label use of the medication. But, in fact, there are some people who actually do seem to benefit. So they will lower, uh, they uh, don't really increase the risk for hypoglycemia as long as you reduce the dose of insulin. Uh, they can cause weight loss. You can reduce the dose of, in, of uh, insulin. They seem to have some improvement of insulin resistance really due to the better glycemic control, but there's no question that it increases the risk for diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, and so that uh, I think that this is a, a class of drugs that is really going to come to the fore. Whether this other new drug is actually going to come to market, I don't know. Uh, as I said, it's at the FDA, where we're, and they're negotiating about all of this stuff now. So I think that uh, at the moment uh, is kind of pending. So with that, let me thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. So have you found any good oral hypertensions for patients who are in, like, serotic or have uh, like CKD-3 kidney disease? So there are two questions that were asked. One is about uh, indications or contraindications for liver disease, and then the second for chronic kidney disease. So let's start with the second one first for chronic kidney disease. So there's very well defined um, limits for certain medications for chronic kidney disease that have, because of data that have accumulated. So there's no question that anything can be used down to a GFR of 60. Uh, when you get below GFR of 60, there's a decrease in clearance of some of the medications. Insulin is one who starts to go down, and you have to just be wary about dosing of insulin. Metformin you can actually use below GFR of 60, and you can actually go down to 30, but you probably ought to reduce the dose to 1,000 milligrams a day by at 45, and then stop at the 30, because of the risk of accumulation and potential risk of lactic acidosis. These SGLT2 inhibitors uh, really just aren't very effective at lowering glucose levels when you get to the GFR of less than 60, there's still some little bit of an effect when you get down to 45, but they really shouldn't be used with a GFR less than 45 from a glucose lowering effect. Now, let's stop for a minute because there are a lot of cardiovascular benefits that still seem to be accruing from SLP2 inhibitors below a GFR of less than, than 45. 
So whether we should continue to use them for their cardiovascular benefit, I think at this point is a very open question. There are a lot of studies being done nationally looking at patients who've got impaired kidney function and whether SOT3 inhibitors should be continued or even started in those patients for their cardiovascular and renal benefits of that can occur. With the other drugs, um, uh, with the thiazole and D-diont, there's no uh, limitation for uh, kidney function. For sulfonylureas, uh, we stopped glyburide uh, at a GFR of 60, stopped the meparide at 30. Glipizide can be used for less than 30, but uh, you have to use it carefully because it can still cause hypoglycemia. And we get all the classes, I'm not sure. Um, GLP-1 receptor agonists can all be used down to GFR less than 30. Exenatide, or, uh, exenatide stopped at 30. Exenatide stopped at 15. The other ones can be used for all degrees of kidney failure. As far as liver failure goes, um, there are some data that suggest that several of these drugs may improve NASH uh, as it goes on, especially the pyoglitazone has been shown to do this, but other drugs as well. So whether that's simply an effect on glycemic control or whether it's a drug-specific effect, I think is a little bit fuzzy at this point, but uh, there's certainly some data for pyoglitazone for uh, NASH patients. As far as cirrhosis goes, it's not a lot of data comparing drugs, so I'm not sure I can give you a good answer. I think in general we, we don't use metformin in patients who have true bad cirrhosis, but other than that, there's not a lot of uh, other, other problems. Other questions? Yes, sir. So with the warning of uh, amputations with the SGLT2 yeah. inhibitors, one, what is the uh, population or the patient which you avoid? And second, how do you convince the patients? Because the time I mentioned amputation, they get freaked out. Okay, so the question that arises about uh, the risk of amputations of peripheral vascular disease in patients uh, who are getting SGLT2 inhibitors. So the, the major group of data is with canagliflozin, uh, that shows a significant increased risk for amputations in their major cardiovascular outcomes that the campus study. There are other studies that have looked at it with catagliflozin that don't actually show that increased risk. There are no data that show there's an increase with epagliflozin or with dapagliflozin. So in general, so whether this is a class effect, whether it's any effect at all, or whether it's limited to catagliflozin, I think is a controversial area at the present time. I think if you, have, if you have somebody who's got clearly significant peripheral vascular disease, they've had an amputation, they have a foot ulcer, and the like, I probably would avoid the class at the moment, although I'm not sure I really believe that it's a class effect myself. So if I really had to use one, I probably would use amphitophosin, but uh, I, I tend not to use any of them at the moment, and hopefully this will all blow away someday, because uh, I'm not sure I really believe it. Other questions, comments? Can you talk about type 2 diabetes? So in, uh, in patients uh, like late onset uh, diabetes, like autoimmune diabetes or yeah. like LADA, uh, you see it in late onset and they are sometimes they are obese. What is the role of metformin <coughs> in those patients? You know that like, they behave like type 1 diabetes. Well, I, mean, I, think, I don't think there's a lot of data on using these, any of these drugs that we talked about specifically in LADA. So what LADA is, is really type 1 diabetes. It's an autoimmune disorder that appears relatively late uh, compared to the kids. So often in the, in the 20s, 30s, 40s even, uh, will present with this type of diabetes. And it's a slow presentation over years rather than a relatively abrupt presentation like we usually think about with type 1 diabetes. And so often they can be treated with an oral agent for a period of time, uh, but usually not for that long a period. So, there's no real reason that you can't use any of these other drugs, but I don't think there are any specific comparison studies. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you can get by with several months or more, including the point. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm I barely mentioned insulin. The type 1 diabetes, can you imagine it? Right. Okay, well, again, thank you very much for your attention.